Shalom Aleichem, welcome. I'm Lisa Newman, the Yiddish Book Center's Director of Publishing and Public Programs, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Yiddish Book Center's Virtual Theater for tonight's program with Deborah Dashmore, co-presented with the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization. The Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization is a vibrant, growing collection of text and images curated by leading Jewish studies scholars. It offers unprecedented direct access to excerpts from thousands of primary sources reflecting Jewish creativity, diversity, and culture worldwide, spanning biblical times to the 21st century when complete. Before we get started, please note that your video will be off and your audio muted throughout the program. You may submit questions to us via the question panel at the lower right of your screen. We ask that you keep questions short and please refrain from comments so that we can try to get to all of the, com the questions this evening. I'm delighted to introduce this evening's presenter, Deborah Dashmore. Deborah is a Frederick G.L. Hutwell Professor of History and Judaic Studies at the University of Michigan. An American Jewish historian, her work focuses on urban Jews. She's the editor-in-chief of the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization. She also served as co-editor of the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, Volume 10, late 20th century, 1973 to 2005. In recent years, Deborah has been teaching and studying documentary photography. She's also engaged in a number of major editorial projects, including the three-volume award-winning City of Promises. She is the author of several books, including G.I. Joe's, How World War II Changed a Generation. Welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much, Lisa. It's great to be here. It's G.I. Joe's, though. Oh, G.I. Joe's. <laughs> My father wrote comic books. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. Well, and I'll hand off to you. <laughs> it was okay. meant to uh, evoke, you know, G.I. Yes. Joe, obviously. Okay. <laughs> Um, so it's really wonderful to be here, and we're going to start um, um, this talk with uh, Betty Friedan, okay? Um, because Betty Friedan really takes us into um, feminism in general in the U.S. as well as Jewish feminism. So uh, I think we have a, a slide on her famous book, and I want to tell you a little bit about her. She has a Midwest upbringing. She comes to Smith College. She's radicalized at Smith College, um, and when she graduates, um, she becomes a journalist, and she writes for the United Electrical Workers Union. Um, in the late 40s. This was a left-wing communist union, uh, but with the rise of McCarthyism and anti-communism, this kind of work was not um, viable for her anymore. She retreats then to less political work. She marries, she has kids, um, they're living in New York City, but then they move out to the suburbs. And in the late 50s, she takes on the task of interviewing Smith graduates, fellow female graduates, to see what they had done since graduation. And that leads her to a larger study, which ultimately becomes the feminine mystique. So Lisa mentioned that the Posen Library contains excerpts um, of works by Jews um, and that are important to Jewish culture and civilization understood very broadly. And what I'm going to be presenting now comes out of the collection, which you can either get in terms of physical volumes or you can go online, as that slide indicated, for free, as long as you, uh, you register. So we have an excerpt on the Posen Library. Uh, digital library website um, from Betty Friedan's Feminine Mystique. And I would just want to share a couple of words from it. The problem, she writes, lay buried, unspoken, for many years in the minds of American women. It was a strange stirring, a sense of dissatisfaction, 
a yearning that women suffered in the middle of the 20th century in the United States. Each suburban wife struggled with it alone as she made the beds, shopped for groceries, matched slipcover material, ate peanut butter and jelly sandwiches with the, her children, chauffeured Cub Scouts and brownies, lay beside her husband at night. She was afraid to ask even of herself the silent question, is this all? Now, Friedan, of course, asks that question and she gives it a name and the name is the feminine mystique. And then she goes on to write, the feminine mystique has succeeded in burying millions of American women alive. There is no way for these women to break out of their comfortable concentration camps, except by finally putting forth an effort, that human effort which reaches beyond biology, beyond the narrow walls of home to help shape the future." Close quote. So the reference there to comfortable concentration camp is, I hope, a bit jarring. Right? We don't think of the suburbs in such a way, but it draws upon Friedan's Jewish consciousness and the writings of psychologists, especially someone like Bruno Bettelheim, about what the concentration camps were like. And although she was later criticized for making such a comparison and, and did apologize for it, I think it signals to us how important a Jewish consciousness was to the articulation of this form of feminism. It's not out there front and center, but it's right there shaping how Friedan comes to understand what she's seeing in, in suburban life. And Jewish involvement in the feminist movement in part reflects the changing status of American Jewish women. By 1970, over 50% of American Jewish women were attending college. And therefore, the protest movements of the 1960s reached many of them, and many of them, of course, participated um, in these protest movements. Out of these experiences come an understanding of the social construction of sex roles um, and the argument that gender overcame all other differences among women, right? differences of class, ethnicity, race, religion. Right? In that sense, neither Judaism nor Jewishness was seen particularly as important by such leaders of American feminism as Friedan in the early years. Now, those of you in the audience who are older can remember all of the things that women could not do in the 1960s. They couldn't get a mortgage in their own name. They couldn't get a credit card. They couldn't even wear slacks to school. Um, they certainly couldn't participate in sports. I could go on. For those of you in the audience who were too young to remember, I think it's important to recognize the context of women's disempowerment. It wasn't just that women were regularly paid less than men. It was that women's rights were severely circumscribed, placing women in a subordinate position to men. When in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, no discrimination on the grounds of sex was added to it, the addition was done in the hope that the clause would torpedo the entire act. It was such a preposterous in some ways thing to think about. It didn't happen, right? So the result is that women's rights became entwined with other civil rights. And Jewish women's political activism in the 60s and on into the 70s, right? They, it began with civil rights, it extended to the peace movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, um, and that in 1966, you have the founding of NOW, National Organization of Women. In the early 70s, 1972, Congress passes the Equal Rights Amendment, 
And the Jewish feminist movement also gets started. 1972, right, the first woman rabbi, Sally Presand, was ordained. The following year, as I'm sure many of you are aware, 1973, Roe v. Wade was decided by the court legalizing abortion. Congress at that point debates an amendment to restrict abortion, but it does not pass. In 1973, the first Reconstructionist woman rabbi, Sandy Sasso, is ordained. And what is, of course, very unusual is she is married to another rabbi, Dennis Sasso. Um, they met in rabbinical school, um, and they both made their careers in Indianapolis. So if we could have the next slide, I have a, a couple of other feminists up there um, that I wanted you to take a, a look at. I think that's what's on the next slide. I never remember exactly. Ah, no, I have Ezra Nashim. Okay, we'll, we'll get to Ezra Nashim in a moment. What Jewish feminists wanted and why Ezra Nashim is important is they wanted our equal participation in Judaism. They engaged in an attack on Judaism as a patriarchal religion because gender was central to Jewish law, that is to say to halacha. Yet, there was, they recognized a willingness to change Judaism, to see its patriarchy as something that could be overcome. And for these Jewish feminists, unlike, let's say, for Friedan, their Jewish identity was too rooted in their own culture for them to abandon it. So they wanted not just to change the patriarchal character of Judaism, but they also wanted to reclaim Jewish women in history, to hear the voices of Jewish women, and ultimately to um, aim for gender neutral language of prayer, to change perceptions of God and God's relationship to the Jewish people. Right? And they were aware, of course, of the morning blessing, the prayer that thanks God for not making me a woman, um, to be said, obviously, uh, not by a woman. So in the early 1970s, they, Jewish feminists began to move beyond consciousness raising discussion groups and collectives to deliberately challenge established Jewish institutions and practices. And they called themselves, what, this group in New York, Ezrat Nashim. It was a small study group of young feminists associated with the New York Chavura, which itself was a movement that presented an alternative to established synagogues. Um, and this countercultural fellowship of, of Chavurot existed in a number of different cities in Boston, with Chavurat Shalom in uh, New York, in Washington, D.C. as well. It was designed to create an intimate community for study, for prayer, and for social action. But it was not focused particularly on women. And as Rat Nashim decides to take the issue of equality, of women to the 1972 convention of the conservative rabbinical seminary, sem, excuse me, the conservative rabbinical assembly, which was being held up in the Catskills. The women involved in Israt Nashim represented the highly educated elite, primarily, but not exclusively, of conservative Jewish youth. Okay, so um, let me just check what we've got on the screen here. All right, that has some of the uh, issues of what they wanted. Let's go now to the next slide, which is a, a reproduction of Jewish women's call for change. Uh, you'll notice um, some of it's written handwritten, um, including uh, the parts that's written in Hebrew, um, as well as the title. This was a mimeographed uh, piece of paper that they handed out. What did they want? They wanted women to be granted membership in synagogues. Synagogues had moved beyond having only men members to having family membership. But if you were a single woman, um, there was no way for you to be a member. It was among the things that weren't available for women. Somewhat more radical than being members, they wanted women to be counted in the women, uh, the minion. 
They wanted women to be allowed full participation in ritual. In other words, to have aliyot, to be allowed to read from the Torah, to lead services. They wanted women to be recognized as witnesses in Jewish law. In other words, to remove them from the classification uh, with children and deaf mutes. They wanted women to be allowed to initiate divorce. They wanted women to be allowed also to attend rabbinical and cantorial schools and to fulfill those functions in synagogues. But they don't actually say, which is really interesting, that women should become rabbis and cantors, which is, you know, um, they're, they're somewhat cautious. L let us go to school <laughs> uh, first, and, and then we would be able to become women in cantors, and in a sense is what they're saying. They want women to become professional leaders in Jewish communal organizations, and they want women to be bound to fulfill all the mitzvot equally with men. Okay, so why was this radical? Well, I think the answer is that these were demands that were just at the moment sort of unthought of. They were targeted to the conservative movement because the conservative movement took all of these issues very seriously. Um, the oldest of these young women who brought this demand to the rabbinical assembly was 27. They were young women. Um, it took 11 years to achieve many of the goals of the call for change. In 1983, JTS votes, Jewish Theological Seminary votes to ordain women rabbis, and Amy Eilberg is the first one um, who is ordained in 1985. But they don't achieve everything. They don't achieve the possibility for women to initiate divorce. They don't achieve uh, the possibility for women to be witnesses in Jewish law. Right? Uh, they don't achieve everything. And this call for change, when they go up to the Catskills meeting, you know, they wanted to present it to the rabbis, but they, they can't. So instead, they, they present it to the wives of the rabbis, right? Um, and the wives listen. And there are some, some of the um, rabbis also uh, listen to them. Um, it's an agenda that stresses equal access, right, of women and men to public roles of status and honor within the Jewish community, right? It focuses on eliminating the subordination of women in Judaism by equalizing their rights, right? So this is a goal of equality, um, of getting women trained for leadership positions as in synagogues, as rabbis and cantors, um, and the recognition of the fact that the secondary status of women in Jewish law rested on their exemption from certain mitzvot, right? Um, which is why they wanted to say women should be called upon to, you know, observe all of them. As Ratnashin was really lucky because the New York City press picked up on it um, and it, they got a lot of publicity. So in the next slide, I have, um, I think we're on the next slide, uh, three very different women who are Jewish feminist activists uh, of different backgrounds. Both Paula Hyman and Letty Cotton Pogrebin uh, are included in the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, but Steinem is not, which is an interesting choice that the editors made. It's probably due to the fact that she's a child of intermarriage. Um, Pogorin was born in 1939 and Hyman in 46. And both of them have had very articulate careers. Um, Paula Hyman of blessed memory is no longer alive. She be became a extremely influential um, scholar, academic um, uh, with a career that took her to Yale University. Uh, Pogreben, fortunately, is still with us and in fact has a, a brand new book out called Shonda. Um, Pogreben was ready um, in her writing as a journalist to oppose uh, radical feminists who attacked Zionism and Israel. Um, and uh, we're, I'm going to show you some material um, from what she writes in that regard in a couple of minutes. 
Um, what I want to emphasize now, however, is how intertwined feminism and Jewish activism was. There were different paths that women took. Some started out on the feminist path um, with, with the notion that the personal is political. Others started out on the Jewish path, <laughs> questioning Judaism, and that leads them to feminism. Um, but they, they overlapped in many different and important ways. In the next slide, we see another path, the one taken by Rachel Adler, who starts out within uh, orthodoxy. She's a married woman, um, but she gradually writes a, an article that reflects her shifting consciousness called The Jew Who Wasn't There. Halacha and the Jewish woman. And when she publishes this, it's seen as a really blistering indictment of the status of Jewish women. She publishes it in Davka, which is a countercultural journal. And you know, it's important to feel the, the overlap with the counterculture um, and Jewish feminism and other radical feminists all at the same time. Um, it was a particularly influential piece, Adler's was, for young women who were active in the counterculture. Um, and I have an excerpt here on the slide, which I think is worth uh, reading out loud. It is not unusual for committed Jewish women to be uneasy about their position as Jews. It was to cry down our doubts that rabbis develop their prepackaged orations on the nobility of motherhood, the glory of childbirth, and modesty, the crown of Jewish womanhood. So Jewish feminism, whether from Adler or Hyman or Ezrat Nashim, found a receptive audience. And in 1973, one year after Ezra Nashim, you know, goes up to demand change from the conservative rabbis, secular and religious Jewish feminists get together under the auspices of the North American Jewish Students Network. And they convene a national conference in New York City with over 500 participants. Um, and again, I want to emphasize, you know, the importance of young college students and graduate students who were involved. Um, the following year, there was a, another conference, um, uh, but the first one was, I think, really crucial because although it didn't lead to an organization, it made Jewish feminists feel that they spoke for large numbers of women and indeed some men within the American Jewish community. And one of the women invited to the conference was Blue Greenberg. Um, it, the conference was held at the Hotel McAlpin, and I think I have a slide on, on Greenberg. Um, she was born in uh, Seattle and then raised there uh, in New York. And she asks the question, can a mild-mannered yeshiva girl find happiness among the feminists? And she wasn't so sure. Um, she writes, um, in the selection in the Posen Library. On occasion, I have been asked, how can one so rooted in Jewish tradition, so at home with halachic prescriptions and proscriptions, have such strong feminist leanings? Are the two not mutually exclusive, anomalous, contradictory? And she goes on to say, you know, that I was indeed born in a strongly traditional family with all the structure this entails, it was quite natural to be socialized early into the proper roles. I knew my place and I liked it. The warmth, the rituals, the solid tight parameters. I never gave a thought as to what responsibilities I did or didn't have as a female growing up in the Orthodox Jewish community. It was just the way things were, the most natural order in the world. But then, you know, she marries in the late 50s. She has children, of course. The turning point comes with this conference, not the paper that she wrote, but the experience. More significant was the conference experience itself and the larger group that was present. To my amazement, there were some 500 women from every point along the continuum, 
not just the 25 die hard hardcore types I had expected to find. Although all were feminists, they were not hostile to Judaism. A good many of them, especially those with no extensive Jewish background, had come to Judaism through feminism. So Blue Greenberg does, of course, become a feminist, and she remains active to this day, very much within the Orthodox world. Adler, on the other hand, um, gradually moved from orthodoxy to reform and constantly challenged halakha. She wrote um, what I think you know, is a, a very uh, powerful new marriage contract. It has not yet caught on widely, but maybe it will, called Brit Ahuvim, a uh, lover's contract, to take the place of the foundation of Jewish marriage in the acquisition by the groom of the bride. So Brit Ahuvim takes the place of Kiddushin. Um, and she notes that the wedding ring is not just a minor detail of the ceremony. Metonomically, it represents the whole affair. It is, it is a ceremony without rings, likely to be as convincing as a performative ritual should be. Will the participants feel married? Will the wedding guests leap up and shout Mazel Tov? <laughs> Or will they shrug and remind one another that it's a free country? So Adler's Brit Ahavim, which is in the Posen Library, uh, along with her rationale for it and description, uh, indeed, of how to dissolve the Brit, right? And how to divorce, in other words, um, suggests an actual ritual um, that does hold on to um, uh, the wedding ring. And I, I urge you to check it out. You know, um, okay, because I, I think it's a, a really uh, provocative, thoughtful, and very moving way of reimagining on an equal basis um, uh, the commitment of two people to be um, in marriage. So I want to return to um, Letty Cotton Pogrebin and, and her path, which was different um, from Blue Greenberg, from um, Rachel Adler from uh, Paula Hyman, uh, but it was a very important path as well. She came first to feminism, having rebelled against aspects of Judaism, especially after the, the death of her mother at a, a young age. And yet at the same time, Pogrimin was ready to challenge non-Jewish feminists in regards to their attitudes towards Israel and Zionism. And she was ready to raise the question of anti-Semitism. I think I have a slide here um, on that, yes. So in her book, a, a, a memoir that she writes, she says, feminism has never systematically analyzed the similarities between anti-Semitism and sexism the way that racism and sexism are understood as twin oppressions. Yet the parallels are striking. And indeed, you know, at the moment, we are um, at a point where it's really worthwhile remembering this. Um, uh, she recognizes early on, and this is written in the 1980s, that there's a problem of anti-Semitism both from the right and from the left. Um, she talks about what she calls the three eyes, insult, invisibility, and internalized oppression. Um, the notion that Jews are blamed for inventing patriarchy um, and uh, that the ways in which Jews are um, uh, understood um, prevents them from actively participating um, as, as feminists. They have to subordinate aspects of themselves. Um, there's a myth of female power, uh, of controlling the press, uh, which is connected with Jewish power, of leisured women, and of course, of affluent Jews. Um, uh, so 
these are twin oppressions in Hogerman's analysis. And that's a, a very important piece that she writes. Um, initially, she writes this in Ms. Magazine, um, which she was a co-founder of, um, but then includes it in the uh, autobiography there. Um, I, I want to move now to one of the visual um, elements of visual culture. And this is of Martha Rosler. Uh, it, it's from a series, as, as the slide indicates, called House Beautiful, Bringing the War Home. And Rosler works both as a photographer, a videographer, um, but also in photo montage. And she does this in order to explore issues from everyday life and the media, um, and especially as they affect women. Um, in this particular photo montage, what you can see is the way in which the ideal kitchen in white <laughs> with the, the red bowls um, leads to these soldiers, right? I mean, this is done during the, the Vietnam War and it, it dramatically puts the soldiers into what is understood to be uh, female space. In fact, the soldier on the right, uh, although he has a, a weapon in his hand, you know, one could almost imagine him vacuuming or at least I can imagine him vacuuming. There's this, this strange way in which they become, the two soldiers become part of um, this uh, house beautiful. Um, in those years, of course, television did bring the war home and people would sit down, you know, with the six o'clock news, both to dinner and to watching the Vietnam War. Um, I think that Rosler's um, photo montage series has been uh, really important in providing a critical feminist view, um, and I would add a Jewish feminist view um, on the politics of our uh, time. She's done photos ranging from um, public spaces, looking at airports uh, and roads, uh, um, airplane food, <laughs> housing, gentrification. It's very uh, powerful work. Okay, so I wanna now um, jump from the United States to uh, some other parts of the world because American Jews in many ways exported feminism. They certainly exported feminism to Israel. Um, and there it took very different forms of expression, both in politics and in culture. Um, and I, Although that we have a number of uh, beautiful uh, visual examples, I want to just draw your attention to a couple of literary examples, in part because the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization is an enormous translation project. And it makes available so many things that were not originally um, written in uh, English. So, um, Agi Michol, um, the, on the next slide, is a, a feminist poem, poet, excuse me. And we include in the Posen uh, Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, her poem, I Too Want to Marry a Housewife. Right? It's a very short poem. Um, it contains only nine lines, lines. Um, but in it, she quietly limbs what a housewife even a desperate housewife brings, right? Um, from the smell of salad and omelet cooking in the evening right? to the gift as it were uh, of not needing to do anything more than to sleep, right? Uh, to recognize if she were so lucky to marry a housewife, she would feel sure that the housewife would take care of the children would shoulder the responsibility. In some ways, Michel is almost meditating on the feminine mystique, but from an imagined position as an outsider, contemplating what it's like to have married a housewife 
even a desperate one, which is how she in fact characterizes um, the housewife she describes in the poem. By contrast, um, Clara Sereni in the next slide writes from a very different perspective. Um, she's an Italian writer, a columnist, a translator, a political activist. Um, she was born in Rome to a politician father and mother who unfortunately died when Sereni was a very young child. And she becomes a context, a, a writer in the context of second wave feminism. So she integrates in her writing elements that are autobiographical um, as well as political. And she has her politics include both left-wing politics as well as Zionist uh, politics. Um, in fact, she moves um, in 1991 to Perugia where she be, was elected deputy mayor um, for social policies for a couple of years. Um, and she has won a number of awards. We have a selection from uh, her novel, Imaginary Kingdoms, which is where she explores what it means to change identities as in this slide. So I think um, I'll just read to you this quote and then give you the context. It doesn't occur to him that perhaps Mimo is searching for a new meaning to give to Uriel the name he has chosen for himself. So this is about two uh, brothers um, and one of them is leaving to go to the land of Israel and the other one is not and trying to figure out how to relate to this changed identity that his brother um, has adopted. And um, Sereni writes, together they would build a state, plant a garden in the desert. They would be the very first, but many others would surely join them. Finally, um, I want to uh, give us an excerpt from um, Raina Rafi, um, who is a um, novelist in the next slide. Um, uh, born in Argentina, um, but who writes her first novel, it's published in 76, and leads to her being uh, banned in terms of any publication in Argentina. The novel is has explicit lesbianism in it, as well as explicit uh, critique. So she suffers a, a twofold censorship as a woman writer, um, as a woman that is, and also by an authoritarian state. She moves in 1988 to Madrid and that move really allows her to um, find a voice or a subjectivity that will break through the censorship and to um, document it. And Rafi has written about her Sephardic origins, as well as about South America um, and explores memories through a feminist lens. I, I'm going to read you just a, a short selection um, from the Posen Library. During the bitterest days of my European exile, I turn to the photo album where I keep, along with more recent memories, a few images from my childhood. Images that enlarged and corrected come back to me in dreams and in disturbing moments of insomnia. That is when I see the child I was and the people I loved. And when my first and perhaps only home comes clearly into view in that house, as if on stage or in a boxing ring, everyone defended his or her own territory with blood, sweat and tears. And Aunt Red, however, seemed to stay behind the scenes. She didn't want to fight over the space. She wanted to leave it. I secretly shared her desire. We both believed that beyond the walls of that house, a kind of salvation awaited us. And th this character of the aunt is a very um, powerful one. Um, and I pulled a, a, just a short um, selection uh, for the slide, according to her older sister, who never kept secrets for her. Once, when Aunt Rita couldn't find the 10th man, she decided to take his place. Indeed, I think that 
um, uh, Rafi is explicit um, reflections on gendered politics in her writing um, in the context of the late 20th century, um, it gives us a, a really fine sense of um, the impact that feminism, Jewish feminism, has had more broadly um, uh, throughout the Jewish world. So I want to try to pull this um, talk together a little bit um, to suggest that feminism becomes one of the main characteristics of Jewish culture and civilization starting really in the years after um, World War II and most especially, I would say, with Betty Friedan. There are certainly uh, precursors who are very important to her um, and other expressions of feminism in other parts of the world prior to World War II, um, but we see it blossoming in these years after the war because of the context of the United States, which for all its restrictions on women do in fact empower them to go to college. And that opportunity to gain an education opens up opportunities also to participate in the politics of the 1960s. And those politics were powerful politics that transformed how young Jewish women understood themselves and therefore how they came to understand the world in which they lived, both the restrictions that they faced in American society, but also the restrictions that they faced as Jews. Um, and it's that confluence of these two things together that really um, becomes incredibly powerful. That's why you can get Jewish women as rabbis as early as 1972, right, in the United States. Um, that's why it not just reform, but reconstructionist, uh, conservative. And now, of course, we, we have rabbis within elements of the Orthodox movement as well. And all of the changes that, that have occurred um, are a fruit of the context in which feminism initially takes root in the United States. And then the fact that it moves, it travels. It travels not just, of course, to Israel, but throughout um, the Jewish world, wherever Jews live. And it takes expression in many different forms, uh, both in terms of visual culture, but also in terms of writing. So that by the 21st century, I think that feminism is an integral part of Judaism. I, I don't see how one could um, uh, pull it out, right? It's, it's woven into the strands uh, of Judaism as an integral part of Jewish culture and civilization. And for those of us who are engaged in um, curating the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, um, it has brought a consciousness um, to what we do as we look back into earlier periods where there weren't necessarily explicitly feminist uh, writers or thinkers, but where there certainly were women, <laughs> Jewish women. And some of what's on the Posen Library uh, of Jewish Culture and Civilization's website uh, in terms of women's uh, writing is truly um, amazing and very exciting. So I think I will um, end here and I'm very willing to uh, take your questions. Um, let's see, I'm not quite sure how I um, do that, but yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Deborah, that's fascinating. It was a fascinating talk. <laughs> so thank you um, for letting me sit in the audience and listen as well. Um, and I think it really illuminates the work of the Posen Library in terms of all that 
that work brings to this conversation. So I'm going to start peppering you with questions. Okay. Um, do we know who wrote the Erzat Nashim document? I'm curious to know where they went in their careers. Ah, um, it was a collective document, um, and that reflected um, feminist um, commitments, right? It wasn't about the individual <laughs> who was um, going to, you know, um, gain the credit, as it were. Mm -hmm. So Paula Hyman was involved with Ezra Nashim, um, and I am sure she um, wrote some of it, right, a as a collective document. Uh, Judith Plaskow was also involved in Ezra Nashim, and she also, I'm sure, was, you know, part of, of the, the writing team. But I think it would be um, wrong for me to uh, single out um, any, uh, any single individual as the writer of it because the, their commitment, as Rat Nashim's commitment was to a collective um, Jewish understanding, right? They were, they didn't sign it individually. Right, mm -hmm. that was um, important and on purpose. Okay, you yeah. know. So, but many of them, many of them went on to careers um, in, in academia. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned, Hyman going to Yale, Plaskow uh, also uh, became an important uh, religious studies scholar. Um, you know, publishing um, widely and, and a very important book. Um, on um, Jewish theology. Uh, so yes, th they, they had good careers afterwards, yes. 10 years after the publication of your Posen Library volume, do you think today that the editors would still not include Gloria Steinem? <laughs> um, okay, so I think that probably not. I think that the editors would have decided um, today to include her. Steinem has always um, said that wherever there is anti-Semitism, she is a Jew, right? Um, she mm -hmm. fights against it um, as, and I think that, you know, connects with Letty Pogrebin's um, arguments about seeing, um, you know, anti-Semitism as, uh, and racism, you know, these, these double oppressions, right, which Steinem also being opposed to racism. Uh, and I think that uh, the editors, you know, which means me and my colleague Nurit Geertz, um, that we would have uh, probably sought to include her. It was, it was very difficult to make um, decisions about whom to include. Um, and volume 10 was the first of all the volumes to come out. There was a lot of debate about it. Yeah. Which leads to another question, which is, were you doing this now? Who do you think is taking on the mantle of this work? Um, well, say that again. Were I doing they, this they, now? They're asking basically if you were to be engaged in putting together a similar volume now, um, who who would who would that represent? Is this work sort of continuing? Oh, um, on some level, I, yes, it is. Um, although at the moment there isn't um, a volume eleven planned, as it were, you know, that would start in two thousand and five, which is when volume mm. ten ends. Um, but there have been uh, what we call companion volumes published. Um, there was. Um, David Roski's published a volume on um, uh, Voices from the Warsaw Ghetto that really pulled together a, a, a bunch of very diverse kinds of voices because, you know, you, you can't put everything in, right, <laughs> into these, these volumes. Uh, selection and, and curation is really part of what makes them very interesting. Um, and so there have been companion volumes, and I'm in, in a conversation with another scholar about a, a companion volume that Joss focuses on women's voices in the, the uh, early uh, modern period, uh, which it would be really incredible. Uh, so 
the, the library has stimulated people to start thinking about um, not just, you know, the greatest hits, right, of, of <laughs> Jewish culture and civilization, but how, if you expand that category, how incredibly rich and diverse Jewish culture and civilization is. Now, it means you, you've got to get people to translate stuff because a lot of stuff hasn't been translated. And we have, you know, over two dozen languages been translated, you know, from, from Afrikaans to Yiddish, right? And everything in between. Uh, so that's really important, but expanding the understanding of what constitutes Jewish culture and civilization, it's, yeah, that's an exciting project, yes. <laughs> Do you include Marge Percy in your list of Jewish feminists? Oh, yes, I do. Um, I didn't mention her. <sighs> okay. You know, one, one can't include everybody, but absolutely. Um, Marge Percy is a, a really um, important uh, and influential writer um, and poet. And she's very interesting, too, in the way in which actually like Grace Paley, uh, um, uh, some of her writings have moved from her own personal expression actually into prayer books, right? into liturgy. You can find it in a, a number of um, Sidorim. Uh, and I think that that is a, is a process that um, I, I did not have time to talk about, but could have the ways in which um, Jewish women's voices uh, are incorporated into the the liturgy, whether it's the liturgy, uh, the standard Sabbath prayer book, or um, the Machs or the the High Holiday uh, prayer book. I, I think that is another sign of the impact of of feminism. Yeah. Um. This is a funny one for me to read, but it's interesting. You say that the earlier women writers weren't necessarily feminists, but this doesn't seem to go along with what they wrote about as being retrieved by the Yiddish Book Center. I didn't, I didn't oh, write this question, great. but i um, curious because we are doing a lot of work with um, Yiddish women writers, bringing it out in translation, and uh, they were very strong voices. So what is, yeah, are there roots there that you see? Oh, yes. I mean, you know, um, Anita Norwich has done some incredible stuff. She's a, a friend and colleague, right? I hear from mm -hmm. the University of Michigan. Um, and the, the reclamation of um, Jewish women writing um, has led us to uh, reevaluate um, who they were. So in some ways, uh, you know, you have to bring to consciousness these, right? I mean, she just published this this book of short stories of someone wh whom I admit I had never heard of her until Anita <laughs> told me about her, um, you know, and they're great short stories. They're really powerful, uh, definitely feminist. Um, but, you know, Anita writes in her introduction to this that um, there were two copies in, in the United States, only two copies. I mean, you know, publishing in, in Warsaw, or whatever, 1939. It's, yeah. So I think it's a fabulous project that the Yiddish Book Center is engaged in. It's a very important project and it will lead to um, re-evaluations. Um, obviously, some of this is not in the Poser Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization, uh, although Anita Norwich served on our advisory board. Um, but, you know, in the future, sure, it, it will have an impact. Yes, and Anita has had a major impact, as have yeah many of her colleagues, and we're Absolutely. proud to be uh, about to publish through White Coat Press one of her forthcoming works in translation. Oh, fantastic. Yes, okay. um, and her her selection, uh, are you with the, I'm sorry, her latest book, Fear, is our next selection in the Great Jewish Books Book Club. Cool. Uh, what do you see as the role of social class in Jewish feminism? Ah. That's a very good question. Um, so most Jewish feminists come out of middle class homes, but not all. Some of them come out of working class homes. What I uh, see as crucial, though, is that even those who are coming out of the working class homes are um, 
encouraged to go to college. I, I really think that that decision to invest in a girl and to say, no, it doesn't end with high school, your education, but you're gonna to go to college is a very important um, investment on the part of a family. And that cuts across social class. There are very few um, Jewish feminists who are coming out of uh, well-to-do homes. Um, it, that's, you know, I mean, there, there are some writers, I mean, Maria Wukaiser mm -hmm. and, you know, others who, who do come out of uh, uh, wealthy backgrounds. But I, I think that the feminists that are engaged in actively changing American society, most of them are, are either coming out of middle class or working class um, uh, homes, but with this commitment to education. Mm -hmm. Any role played in Jewish feminism by Jewish camping? I don't think they mean that going camping, but no, no, <laughs> but no. Camp. Jewish yeah. camps. Yeah. Um, yes, I would say camps are really um, uh, valuable. Uh, I don't know that one can say there's a direct correlation, but I think that the empowerment that camps provided for the kids um, in the 50s and 60s, um, the ways in which Jewish camps um, addressed political issues, the role playing that went on in some Jewish camps, um, all of these things helped to uh, create more politically aware youngsters. And that ends up having an impact on in terms of Jewish feminism. Um, I, I wouldn't label the camp experience a feminist one. I don't think it is. Mm -hmm. um, but I, these other elements uh, that Jewish camps did empower their campers to take, you know, make decisions, take control, decide, you know, what to do. I, I think that 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 becomes important. Will there be a companion volume or volumes about Jewish women of color, Sephardic Jews who have immigrated from the Middle East, Iraq, Iran, India to the U.S.? Yeah, well, th those are all great ideas. Um, uh, and it's possible. And I don't know the person who made that you know, question, but if the person has uh, some specifics in mind and wants to propose something, I, I would definitely entertain it. So. Um, and this will be your last question, um, uh, which is, were the U.S. feminists as aware of the international feminists as the international feminists were of the U.S. feminists? Well, OK, U.S. feminists become aware of the international feminists starting in 75 when you, you have that decade of uh, feminism and they go down to Mexico City and um, for the conference and, and they realize, wow, there are all these other feminists. I mean, that's also the place where a feminist like Bella Abzug, you know, comes upon um, the issue of Israel, right? And the, mm -hmm. the attack by feminists, international feminists on Zionism. So the, you know, the, the Zionism is racism, resolution that gets adopted by the UN is proposed first among the feminists um, down in this international gathering. And, and that is a really, you know, complicated question. I mean, that's partly why um, Letty Pogrebin ends up, you know, in the early 80s, finally writing about this, right? Because, you know, the, the solidarity that US feminists have wanted to experience with international feminists runs up against mm -hmm. um, the issues of um, Palestine and Israel. Deborah, I want to thank you. This is quite an amazing program um, and a privilege to have you on. Thank you. We've enjoyed having you at the center, but this evening's program virtually was just wonderful. And I know it comes after a long day for you that you had to race to the set as it were. <laughs> so thank you so much. Um, I also want to give a huge thanks to the Posen Library of Jewish Culture and Civilization for their co-sponsorship of this evening's program.
So, and thanks to our producer, Elizabeth Carteropoli. Tonight's program is part of an ongoing series of programs brought to you, as I like to say, live from the Yiddish Book Center. I hope that you'll join us Thursday, December 13th at 7 p.m. for Fear and Other Stories with translator Anita Norwich. To see the full. It'll be good. <laughs> we'll see you there. <laughs> um, to see the full schedule of events and to register for programs, please visit yiddishbookcenter.org slash events. I'd like to also take a moment before you leave to thank all of our members whose support makes all of our ongoing work possible. Please consider becoming a member and supporting our work, yiddishbookcenter.org slash donate. Until next time, stay well, stay happy, and see you soon. Thanks.